Hello and welcome back to Soteriology 101 where we're giving short answers to some really hard questions. There are some theologians that believe and teach that mankind is born hating God, that their nature is fallen and corrupt to the point where they literally hate the things of God. They cannot want the things of God unless God changes them to make them want the things of God. But is this what the Bible really teaches? I want us to go through this and really understand this from, I think, a biblical perspective and understanding that we are not born in such a condition that we have no control over our desires and our responses to God's call to be reconciled from our fallenness. I believe this is very important because some theologians, though well intending, what they're trying to do is really show how bad we are. And we are bad. We are in a sinful condition. But Sometimes you can overstate your case so much so that you make the case even worse. Because when you say that mankind is so bad that they can't control their desires in such a manner that they can only hate God, you're ultimately, in my estimation, giving them back the very excuse that I believe Paul is taking away in Romans chapter 1. When he says that God's nature is made known to all people clearly so that they may recognize him as God and honor him as God. And therefore, they are without excuse for not living in faith and believing in him. If you say that mankind is born with a condition that they cannot desire and to do the things that God has called them and clearly revealed to them, then you're ultimately, I think, giving the very excuse that Paul is taking away. So let's look at this from a biblical perspective and try to understand that we can, yes, if we continue to suppress the truth and unrighteousness and continue to trade the truth of God in for lies, we can become haters of God to the point where we are so defiled in our thinking and that we become calloused and hardened and our consciences become seared, much like the Israelites in Jesus' day who had become the old wineskin that wasn't willing to receive the new wine because they were so hardened and so calloused. They were self-righteous. They thought they were the physicians who had all the answers, and thus they didn't think they needed a physician. These are the kinds of hearts that, that we can become if we continue to suppress the truth in unrighteousness and we continue to trade the truth of God in for lies. This little uh, uh, picture on the screen, I think, gives an illustration of what happens when it comes to the hardening of the heart within the nature of man. Yes, Adam and Eve sinned, and when they sinned, it did cause a, a break in the relationship between God and man. This fall is serious, and we do believe that sin affects all of us and every part of us. It does lead to bondage, but the question is, is being in bondage or being a slave, does that equal being incapable of admitting that you're in bondage and that you're a slave? That's part of the problem with the disagreement that we have between these different theological groups is that some believe that the bondage is such that we can't even admit that we're in bondage. But does the Bible teach this? What I believe the Bible teaches is that as a result of the fall, people are under the curse of sin. They, ha they are lost. They are in need of a Savior. They are morally thus unable to see um, Excuse me, they are morally able to still see, understand, and repent in light of God's revelation, however. In other words, a person who is fallen and in need of a Savior still has the ability to hear about the revelation of God and to respond to that light of revelation. If they believe, then they can be declared righteous by God's grace, not because they've earned or merited their salvation by believing in Him. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the righteous will live by faith. No one is righteous in accordance with the law, but those who are declared righteous throughout Scripture, like Enoch and Job, and we see this even with Simeon in the New Testament and, and other passages throughout the Scripture where almost exaggerated how righteous and blameless these people were uh, throughout the Scripture. Well, how can it be that that Paul says no one is righteous and no one's good and everyone's a sinner. But then on the other hand, we read throughout the scripture, all these people, these this hall of faith this in Hebrews 11 of these people who were righteous. Well, they weren't righteous in accordance with the law. All have fallen short in accordance with the law. No one is righteous in accordance with the law. But there are those who by faith have been declared righteous by God's gracious goodness. And that's the righteousness of Christ imputed on their account. And so Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteous. The righteous, as verse 17 of Romans 1 says, will live by faith. 
These are the ones who are righteous, not their own righteousness, but the righteousness given to them by grace through faith. That is possible for anyone and everyone. Anyone can believe and thus be declared righteous by the gracious goodness of our God who loves us and who wants to save us, who desires for all to be saved. And so what we need to understand is that, yes, mankind is fallen. Yes, they are sinners. Yes, they are in need of a Savior. But they are still able to see, hear, understand, and repent in light of God's revelation. The self-hardened condition is almost like another word for stubbornness. If someone continues to suppress the truth and trade it in for lies, they can grow defiled in their thinking. They can grow calloused and their consciences become seared. It becomes therefore very morally difficult for them to see, hear, understand, and repent. This is why Jesus pulls up a child out of the audience and says, you must become humble like this child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. What's the difference between a a young child and an older man? especially in that culture. Well, the older man is most likely set in his ways. He's not humble. He's not moldable. He's the old wineskins. His conscience is is likely become seared because he's not moldable. He's not willing to learn and to listen, unlike that child. We all have the propensity to become stubborn and self-hardened and calloused in our rebellion against God. And the Bible warns against this in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Do not harden your hearts when you hear his voice. Because that can happen if you continue to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You can grow calloused and harden. There's also a condition within Scripture called becoming judicially hardened. This is when one, as an act of the judge, is cut off in their unbelief, as we see uh, recorded about Israel in Romans chapter 11. These are those who are not cut off arbitrarily for no apparent reason. They're cut off because of their continued unbelief, because they refuse to listen. Even though God holds out his hands to them all day long, as as Romans chapter 10, verse 21 states, they eventually are given over. They're sent a spirit of stupor. They're spoken to only in parables, lest they see, hear, understand, and turn. And God has the right as the sovereign God to do this to those who continue to suppress the truth and those who grow defiled in their thinking. He can use them in their rebellion to accomplish even a redemptive good through them. There are some people who become blinded from God's revelation. They, they become, therefore, morally unable to see, hear, understand, and repent. For how can they believe in one whom they cannot hear? And if they're not hearing because they're ever seeing but not perceiving, ever hearing but not really understanding because of their calloused, hardened condition, as the Israelites of this day often were, then they will not be able to respond to the things of God and the light of his revelation. Now, that calloused heart could be broken through as even Paul holds out hope that those who have stumbled have not stumbled beyond recovery, as Romans 11, 11 says. That those hardened Jews of that day, Paul holds out hope for them that his ministry to the Gentiles could provoke them to envy so that they too might turn and be saved and be grafted back in to the branch that they were once cut off from because of their unbelief. It's very important to understand that mankind aren't born already cut off. There's no one born unloved by their maker. There's no one born rejected by God. There's no child in this world who is not wanted or loved by the God of our universe. He loves us because he is love and he has created all things in his image, all people in his image to be image bearers, to declare his glory. And therefore, every single life matters. Every single person matters to God because to God, every single person bears his image and his glory could potentially be made known and seen through each person. So please help spread the news of God's love and his gracious goodness to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Thanks for tuning in.